The gospel lesson this day comes from the gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter, reading from the 13th to the 21st verse. The text reads as follows. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to, des to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God, to which we could all say, thanks be to God. It is good to be with you again. You know, it's been a very long time since I've preached back to back in the same church. I told my wife this morning, okay, what time is service? Okay, I got to get in a rhythm here. And she looked at me and said, it's only two weeks. <laughs> but indeed, I am grateful to be back with you all at the East Liberty Presbyterian Church, our colleagues and friends from just down the road and the ways in which we partner together in ministry. We're grateful to see so many of you uh, who are uh, participants in one way or another. Some are graduates, some are board members. It's good to see Pastor Patrice and uh, Dr. Alshire, Dan Alshire, who are members of our board. It's good to see all of you on this day. And as for the heat, this is a calm June day in, in, D in D.C. So this is, <laughs> this is par for the course. The good thing about Pittsburgh is this is hopefully as hot as and humid as it's going to get, and then we get into another season. Thank God for that. Uh, but it is good to be with you all on today. I want to continue and conclude the series I started last week with The Faith of Our Convictions, Part 2. And he said, Jesus said, bring that which you have to me. Here in this 14th chapter of Matthew, the scene opens with Jesus. What I did not read was, Jesus has just heard about the murder of his cousin, John. And so, like any of us, having, hearing, having heard this horrific act, Jesus seeks to go away. Retreat from any of the crowds. Probably, probably to attain some rest to grieve, or probably just to commune all by himself. Jesus sneaks off across the sea, away from the masses that have followed him from town to town and place to place. However, instead of finding a deserted place, Jesus, who needs the rest, shows up to a crowd already with many needs. They are sick downtrodden, hungry, shunned, and abandoned, and they have all come and followed this healer teacher to receive the fixes for their predicaments. Jesus, taking stock of the situation, does not retreat further, but instead, the text says, has compassion on them and proceeds to heal, teach, and provide hope and to see about all of their needs. It's there, caught up in the midst of the ministry, that the hour starts to grow late. And the concern begins to grow amongst disciples. You know, disciples are always concerned about something. <laughs> Probably in a panic, I could imagine, they run and tell Jesus, 
to dismiss the crowd because it's too large to provide food for, and they say it's a deserted place, meaning there's nothing around here, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Faced with the predicament of having to feed the vast multitude, the, dis the disciples are quick to get Jesus to dismiss the crowd so that they do not have a problem on their hands. I can imagine then that Jesus' response came as quite a shock when he demands, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. This is the prompt that really does open up this text. For the, the text actually presents us with several problems. There is first the need to address the presenting issues in the crowd that is gathered, the sick, the hungry, etc. They've gathered to be healed, saved, restored, and have all sorts of other human frailties that require attention. But additionally, that as a result of their needs for healing, the disciples now have discerned a new problem. That if these folks stay around here, they're going to need to be fed. And hungry crowds are a perennial problem. But I would submit to you the most pressing problem, the most significant problem in the text, is the one that lies just under the surface of all the others. It's that the disciples, who by this point in the narrative of the gospel, have seen Jesus heal the sick and even restore life to a girl, that these same disciples do not know what to do when people are hungry. They've been around Jesus and witnessed Jesus' actions when needs are presented. Every time Jesus is met with a challenge, he addresses it directly. However, when these disciples are faced with the challenge, they go back into old patterns. They recognize the need that is right in front of them, but declare they don't have the power, the capacity, or the resources to feed the gathered throng, even though Jesus is standing right there. I'm grateful here in this passage that Jesus makes an assumption about the disciples. Jesus assumes that when disciples see a need in people, they will address the need. That they won't just follow him in name, but they'll follow Jesus, they'll follow him by an example, an embodied example. Jesus believes in his disciples enough that if they have the insight and the foresight to see what people need, then they might also have the capacity to themselves address the need that they've identified. However, in this passage, the disciples are much like many of our religious communities today, certainly not like the East Liberty Presbyterian Church, where we struggle to see ourselves as Jesus assumes that we are. A people that believes that God can ad address the needs that God has already allowed us to identify. See, the problem is that we often have the capacity to see the problems and the challenges before us. We say the confessions and prayers, but in the big challenges, we often don't embody that same kind of faith. God has many times given us vision and ability to see bigger and broader than our budgets will allow. But in spite of what God allows us to see, we so often struggle to do what it takes to address the problems that we've identified. Like these disciples, we are quick to pray to Jesus to resolve the issue apart from us with prayers of elimination and eradication without participation or transformation. In the text, Jesus' response to the disciples is most significant for us. For ultimately, in his prompt of both commissioning them to find something for the crowd to eat and taking what they found and blessing it, the two fish and the five loaves, Jesus just demonstrates a faith of conviction. He models in the moment that his disciples don't just diagnose problems, but they fix them. Yes. By directing them first to go and find the food and then multiplying what they have, Jesus pushes them to recognize that if you're going to follow me, you better be prepared to do something about what 
you see. Amen. Amen. I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the amount of times the disciples seem to very quickly forget what Jesus just did the chapter before. It's like Jesus will do this incredible thing, this awesome thing, and then as they, soon as they get into the next town, a new problem emerges and the disciples go back to, we can't do it, we can't fix it. In fact, if I'm honest, next week's lesson in the lectionary, good luck BJ, next week's lesson <laughs> involves Peter and the disciples being scared when the storm is out there and they see a ghost walking on water. And the ghost is actually not a ghost, but Jesus. They just saw him feed the multitude. And now he can't do this. Jesus over and over and over again has to model for them, remind them, conjole them as to how to respond when people need resolution to situations. And with each resolution, the disciples learn more how to be like Jesus. With each faithful act, they learn to depend on the Spirit at work in each other. And they are formed as disciples when they offer themselves faithfully. Now, Lest I blow over the miracle resolution in the text, I think it is worthwhile for us to hear and wrestle and struggle with this miracle, particularly as 21st century readers who are often not particularly uh, attentive to miracles. For most of us, the reading of this ancient text replete with a miraculous feeding smacks as dissonant for our postmodern, scientific, and enlightened minds. I can hear us saying that, you know, such a belief in extraordinary acts and moves of God is totally appropriate for biblical times. But this is 2023. And believing in things like that are from a bygone era. God doesn't do things like that anymore. However, I would submit to you that the matter-of-fact reporting of Matthew in this particular passage pushes us to a simple truth about faith. Belief in what God can do isn't always about some supernatural or cosmic ordering that aligns with the great quotables of the Christian witness from last week. No, belief in what God can do and through Jesus is often what God can do in front of you right now. This, mor this morning's passage illuminates the most basic truths about following Jesus. For when you follow Jesus, you'll discover that he has the nasty habit of satisfying the needs of needy people. The feeding of this crowd reminds us that every miracle serves the purpose of addressing the needs of hurting people. The church would come along later and say these miracles are about proving who God is. But that was not Jesus' concern in the Gospel of Matthew. If you read John, it's a whole other thing. Don't worry about it. But in Matthew, <laughs> Jesus is concerned about addressing the needs of people. The text also helps us to realize something quite revelatory. All miracles are not mysteries. That is to say, miracles are not always about something that happens that is unexplainable. Sure, miracles take place without explanation or remission happens. Cancer goes into remission without any clear uh, explanation. Water gets turned into wine or the woman uh, with an issue of blood gets healed. They happen and they are mysterious. They defy all explanations and reveal to us the awesome power of God through the inexplicable. But many times... Miracles are miracles not because they are mysterious, but because of the bravery or faith that dared to believe or dared to risk. And you see, one of the consequences of our often reading the Bible uncritically is that we fail to really engage the mundanity and the humanity that often ungirds the imagery setting in context for the telling of a story. Yes, in other words, sometimes the cancer disappears. But other times, it is the miracle of modern medicine yes, yes. that causes the cancer to go away. It is not a miracle because it is inexplainable. It is a miracle because it is explainable. Yes, yes. So, 
Walk with me through this miracle for a moment. Imagine with me for a moment, here in this passage, Jesus takes what little the disciples bring and shares it with the multitude. But the multitude that is gathered is not some amorphous crowd. They are a group of people who have traveled themselves from faraway places. They are hurting from the impoverished systems of the day and are living in a context that often does not reward sharing. So even if they had a few morsels, they would keep them hidden because the principles of the day meant that if you were to run into a Roman soldier who was hungry, they could take the food you ate. So you hid it in knapsacks and in, they didn't have pockets, but in the folds of your robes. They keep it from view to ensure that they don't lose it or have to give it away. But what do you think happens if the man who they came to see who heals them has bread, shows the crowd their bread, breaks it, and begins to distribute it amongst the people? Then, in the moment of trust and intimacy, I can imagine that as disciples share with the crowd, others one by one, some taking bits of bread, but others pulling out of their robes their own pieces of bread. The only protein, the only starch they may have had. And in so doing, they too share from what they have with someone who had even less. And they learn that when they, that when, when they see what God can do, when they take the little bit that they have and put it with the little bit that you have, and we now have 12 baskets left over. Now, I know I just messed up some of your theology, <laughs> but let me be clear. This is only a theory of what have, might have happened. But notice what I've done. Just because it is explainable doesn't mean it's any less a miracle. Miracles, in fact, are part and parcel of a life with God. This miracle of the feeding of the multitude isn't a miracle because it's unexplainable. It's a miracle precisely because it shows what happens when disciples believe what God can do. And it's always a miracle. Always and everywhere. Whenever disciples have enough faith to live out the faith of their convictions. When disciples have enough courage to do the thing they see even when they don't think they can. It's a miracle that Jesus still believes in them and subsequently in us, just enough to solve the problems we face. Last week, last week, we learned Paul's testimony to the Romans and that, that, that his testimony makes him write a treatise and reveals and reminds us of what God can do in our lives. But this week, we learned the lesson of an embodied faith that hungry people before Jesus and the disciples can get fed. And they get fed not simply because Jesus does the work all by himself. Miracles happen and needs are met when faithful people are open to the powerful possibilities of what God can do in each of us. When disciples risk believing and living as though problems are already solved because we are with Jesus, when we put our faith in action, and not just through our prayers, because the only prayer that's prayed in this text is, send them away. This isn't faith that examines your own life with Christ, but it's a faith that now is convicted and in so doing serves others. Like Jesus does in this text today, I invite us to do a bit more than just diagnose the problems. But with Jesus, go and see how you might respond to what you see and perhaps perform a miracle. Move beyond your confessions, pronouncements, stated commencements, and performative gestures. Following Jesus with our faith-held convictions means choosing daily to embody those commitments by our actions. If we confess Jesus as Lord, then we act believing that Jesus has empowered us to interrupt the systems of oppression and bring forth peace. 
If we pronounce the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is at hand, then we live as citizens of that kingdom with love and hope for all. If we state our commitments to hospitality, justice, peace, and all the other issues that flow from our commitments to Christ, then we live out our convictions embodying them, disrupting those systems that inhibit those very commitments. If we're living out our faith convictions, the best gesture of your faith is not a performative one, but an authentic life lived for God. Whether it's feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, don't pray them away. But take up the invitation to not send them away, but give them what they need. Amen.